strategies, I'd like to do a little recap of what we've done yesterday. So we started by um, introducing this main object of our interest, which was the conditional probability distribution of, in our case, um, sort of two input variables and two output variables, P, A, B given X, Y. Um, we found how to characterize sort of the most general classical type of model, which we call the local hidden variable model. And these are the models that allow for a representation of the conditional probability distribution in, in this form here. Once, because the um, give you essentially everything, at least with respect to the CHS inequality that we considered. And then we um, found that there are some linear inequalities um, in these correlations. So linear inequalities in this uh, PAB given XY that bound the local hidden variable correlations. And we have found one particular of those, which was the CHSH inequality, the uh, Klaus, Hohr, and Shimoni Holt inequality. Um, and so what we have considered yesterday was sort of the winning probability of this non-local game that I started with, the CHSH game. In fact, we only bounded it, um, we, we only gave an upper bound, which we called, uh, which, which turned out to be 75%. But equally, you could also go for a lower bound. So if suppose you want to play this game and you want to lose with as high probability as possible, this is as hard as winning it with as high probability as possible. As it turns out, it's sort of symmetric. So the CHSH inequality can actually be phrased as one fourth smaller than or equal to winning probability smaller than or equal to three fourths. And this corresponds to this other representation, which is the one that is used on sheet seven with these new random variables A, X, Y, um, to be bounded as its absolute value by two. Okay. And so yesterday I might have had a, 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 an overall sign error here, but with these, at least with the absolute value, I'm just getting rid of the sign problems to some extent. <laughs> Cheap trick, but at least today nothing is wrong on the blackboard or the whiteboard for that matter. Okay. Um, Good, so we have actually proved the bound in terms of the <clears throat> winning probability. And um, then we went on to quantum correlations and we sort of defined what a quantum strategy is. A quantum strategy means that the two players, Alice and Bob, come together, prepare their systems in some specific state, described by this row AB, and they decide on what measurements they're going to do, provided the question that they're going to receive. Then they go to their own location, so their um, um, labs, get the questions, depending on the question, they do a measurement, produce an outcome, and send the outcome back to the referee. And the referee then decides whether they win or lose. And the probability distribution that you get from these quantum strategies can, of course, be uh, phrased using just a Born rule, telling us how to calculate outcome probabilities of quantum measurements. And what you will find, or have already found, if you have already done exercise one of sheet seven, is that quantum strategies can violate the CHSH bound. So in particular, quantum theory does not allow for a local hidden variable model. So that means, uh, obviously, the, what I'm writing down here is not yet. So if, I, if you see this Born rule for the first time, you probably wouldn't be able to decide whether this allows for a local hidden variable model or not. It's just not written in the, in the form that local hidden variable models would have to be written after all. So you wouldn't know. But now that you know that correlations of this form violate the CHSH bound, and the CHSH bound must hold for local hidden variable models, this implies that you know that not every probability of this kind can be written as a local hidden variable model. So that's what I mean when I say quantum theory does not allow for a local hidden variable model. You cannot write this expression in terms of a probability distribution of this kind. That's the main statement. Okay. Um, yes. Are there any questions about, about the part that we have discussed yesterday? <clears throat> So today, um, 
I'd like to um, have essentially one focus on experimental tests, not that we're going to discuss all the details of the experimental tests, but we have to think about, suppose we want to do an experimental test of a bell violation, what do we have to pay attention to? Because there have been some rules of the game. And if the setting, the experimental setting, sort of doesn't respect all the rules, then even if you get a violation of the inequality, you wouldn't really know, is this due to not respecting the rules or is this due to nature really not allowing for a local hidden variable model. So this is the first part. And the second part is going to be to discuss quickly what is the sort of the maximal possible violation of a Bell inequality or of this Bell inequality with quantum strategies. And is it thinkable to go even beyond quantum, quantum strategies? But um, Let's focus on three aspects that were part of the rules of the game. The first one was that the questions X and Y have to be independent from one another and randomly produced, right? They needed to be uniformly at random. Okay, so that was one rule. Another rule was that the question that um, Bob gets, so why, must not influence Alice's outcome. And likewise, the question that Alice gets, so X, must not influence Bob's outcome. So that can be phrased as A must be independent from Y given X. And likewise, B must be independent from X given Y, right? Because on Bob's side, the question Y is given, but then it must not depend on, his answer must not depend on Alice's question. And likewise, for um, Alice. And then after all, um, so the third problem that, that is now not so much a rule of the game, but or sort of what is generally wanted. The third part is that if you do an experimental test and you want to prove a violation of some inequality, inequality in practice, then you better have very good statistics. So you can rule out any other type of noise or, or other types of effects that might have been relevant to your statistics, okay? So um, what you generally need is you need good statistics to show a violation, for instance, here, to show that the winning probability is strictly bigger than 75% with high confidence. And these three points, they are very, very important when you really want to test such a bell inequality in practice. So they. They need to be fulfilled, all of them, but this leads to difficulties in the actual setting that you that you use and the actual experiment that you do. So in experimental implementations. And we will now go um, through them one by one, see what can be done <clears throat> to sort of satisfy these points. And then, uh, yes, then we understand hopefully a bit better why it's not so trivial to do a so-called loophole-free bell test. Good. So let's uh, let's do that. So let's uh, sort of try to remedy well these points. So the first one being that x and y should be uniformly at random and, in particular, independent from one another. Um, so instead of having a referee sending the questions to the two parties, you could sort of change the setting a little bit and say, well, the two parties should generate the questions on their, in their labs, okay? And they should generate it such that, um, well, 
they should generate generate it such that they can prove or at least be very convinced that they're randomly generated so that they get question x equals zero with probability one half and question x equals one also with probability one half and likewise for for bob's question so here what is done is actually we forget the referee and and produce x and y So what is free randomness? Um, all right, so if you have a system that produces random numbers, then these random numbers are, uh, well, they could be randomly distributed to the best of your, your knowledge. You could see that then, so for instance, zero is as likely as one as an output if you have a binary random number generator. Uh, that, then it's random, but it's not necessarily free, freely random. What free randomness means is that they're actually producing random outcomes and the outcomes are independent from anything else that happened essentially before this, right? So whatever other random variable you, you might have or someone else might have is uncorrelated to the outcome that you're having, okay? Um, and this free randomness, um, of course, you can never prove that this really exists in nature because whatever you do, you cannot prove that nature is not super deterministic so that everything is predetermined. That is something we will never be able to rule out. But if you allow the thought that this is not the case, that we are not living in a super de deterministic uh, world, then there are very good arguments for free randomness to exist. For instance, by uh, measuring some qubit state that you have prepared in a close to very pure state, and then you do some post-processing. Then the outcome is, pr provided that super determinism is not the case in our universe, then um, fr free randomness exists. So that's very shakingly argued, okay? Um, so I just want you to know that there is a way to remedy this independence of X and Y and how it is, how it is produced. And now the key point is that since X and Y are produced in different locations, then, and they're used to, uh, and they're done using, for instance, a, a quantum random number generator, so QNRG, then a general relativity tells you that, well, as long as your experiment is fast enough, then one cannot be communicated to the other location in, in the time that you're giving um, if it's fast enough. And this is connected to the second point, namely to this sort of independence from okay. independence of Alice's outcome with Bob's question. So let me now connect this to the second point. So the second point is sometimes called the locality loophole. Sort of, yes, yes. And and I think, ah, actually, Victor pointed it out to me yesterday. So there have been other approaches to sort of argue that these choices are made freely um, using, I don't know, cosmic microwave background radiation or, or human choices and so on. But I mean, if you believe in a super deterministic universe, then human choices are not random either. And neither is the, uh, like the, the microwave background of the universe. So I, I, to, my personal taste is rather to rely on theoretical arguments why we shouldn't live in a super deterministic universe than using some sources that intuitively look more random than other sources. There was a question. So why did X produce random the way you say, why didn't X appear like some kind of game? Do you change the question? Yes. Um, so for the moment, why am I writing the 
the given x and the given y in these two lines? It's, it's actually a good question because um, I do not want to say that a is independent from y. I want to say that a together that x is already given is going to be independent from y. And mathematically, this is a different statement. Um, <clears throat> Um, so what I'm writing down in words here is essentially the so-called no signaling condition on probability distributions that we're going to discuss, not today, but on, on Wednesday in more detail. Okay. And I'm now going to tell you how to remedy this. And uh, then I think it will become clear what can influence what at what time in during the experiment. Yes? So I, I, I don't have a... Okay, so this is about the sort of the human belt test that you're referring to now. Um, so the yes, I mean, I think the people are, would argue that if you ask a million people all across the globe about some random numbers they put in or random input, then this would necessarily have to be uncorrelated. But but these people have been asked to do this, so there is already a correlation in them doing it in the first place. So. Well, I think it should not be correlated, but just that the correlation don't necessarily have to be the ones that would give uh, the correct result. Right, right, right. But so I think it's a funny, funny thing to do, and it's definitely good to do some outreach and make people aware of quantum effects. But like scientifically, I don't see why a random number produced by a million people or two random numbers produced produced by a million people on the globe should be more random than what you actually get if you measure your superconducting circuit in a, in a given basis of a superposition state. So, yeah, if you ask me, but that's a personal taste. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we, I think we should move on to the, to the locality loophole and maybe also make clear a bit um, why I'm writing given X and given Y. So coming back to your question. Um, so we want to make sure that um, Y cannot be needed to generate A, and likewise X cannot be needed to uh, cannot be used, sorry, to generate B. And the idea is to place Alice and Bob in locations that are separated far enough apart from each other. So I'm going, now going to draw um, a space-time diagram. The time is in the y-axis and the space is in the x-axis. So given that Alice and Bob produce the questions already in their labs, so say Alice's lab is here, and this is when she produces x, and Bob's lab is here, and this is when he produces y. So, okay, so here questions are generated. And assuming that nothing can propagate faster than light, which is a, an assumption that to the best of our knowledge is a very reasonable assumption coming also from general relativity. So GR telling us no signal travels faster than light. So what we can do is we can sort of draw the light cones of these points, which tells us where in space-time these values could be known, provided they haven't been known before, which is the assumption of free randomness. So, so this is the point in space-time when they're produced for the first time. They could not have existed here because as by assumption, they only start to exist here. Where could they be? They could be anywhere in the future light cone of these points. So these are the future light cones. Okay. 
Now, what the experiment needs to make sure is that A, the outcome of Alice's lab, is generated before Y could have ever reached her lab. And B needs to be generated before X could have ever, could have ever reached Bob's lab. So somewhere here or here, okay? So for instance, if we say it takes, so this time delta T, then X is used to generate A, B is used, uh, Y is used to gen generate B. So this is when A and B are generated. So it's sort of the answers. And if this happens before the signal of, so the, the Bob, Bob's value could have been signaled to Alice's lab, then under the assumption that this general relativity sort of postulate is correct, A must be independent from Y and B must be independent from X in that sense, okay? So, but this has some implications because it means that First of all, there must be a significant separation between the two labs and the experiments cannot take too long because if, even if they are separated well, if the experiment generating A takes an hour, then we are well within the future light cone of, of the Y value, right? So it needs to be a fast experiment. And even though it's fast, it probably also needs a significant separation between the two, the two labs. So we need, uh, a large separation. And we need fast generation of the values. So fast experiments. And if we have this according to general relativity, we have resolved, so we have sort of closed the locality loop. And it turns out that it's not that easy to satisfy both things at once. All right, and the, the third point about the good statistics. So as I said, this is not really a problem of the rules of the game, but that's just a problem of, of typically photons having the tendency to get lost. So um, in many settings, In particular, when photons on, are involved, the detection rates are, are actually quite poor, or at least you to, used to be poor. They were definitely problematic. So what is the problem here? Um, suppose you have, suppose you use a, phot a photonic setting and somehow the photon has a probability of getting lost, say, I don't know, 20% of the time. So this means you play this game and every more or less fifth round, no outcome is produced because the photon is lost. How do you treat these cases? Because after all, the goal would be to prove that on average, you win the game with such and such probability, right? Now you lose already 20% of your rounds. Do you count them as a win? Do you count them as a lose? Do you count them as a random outcome? What would be the right way of counting them? And how can you still potentially get uh, be convinced that you can violate this winning probability bound of the CHSH inequality? Um, so certainly they cannot be ignored. So for instance, yeah. So um, if no outcome is produced, this cannot be ignored. And I think how these rounds are counted is really also depending on what you would like to show with your experiment. Uh, depending on how groundbreaking the result should be, you should treat your last rounds differently. And given the fact that what we try to show here is that nature is not as classical as we thought initially, we should sort of go for the highest possible standard. Because this is really a profound statement, right? It's really saying 
nat nature is not behaving essentially the way you, you would expect it to be. And this is such an, an impactful statement that you should go with the highest possible standard of counting these rounds, which would be no outcome means you lose. Now, if no outcome means you lose and you lose 20% of the photons, you have no hope of proving a uh, Bell violation. So this means you need to get your detection rates very, very high up to be able to, to do this. Okay, And this is also a problem um, that many of the settings of the previous years before 2015 faced. So this sort of highest standard that I, that I um, phrased in words here is sometimes called an adversarial view. Um, so what we do is typically, um, yeah, so we take um, an adversarial view saying that maybe the rounds that, that, are, that did not produce any outcome were exactly the rounds in which we would have lost. Okay, so sort of the worst possible outcome for the rounds without um, without outcome. And adversarial in the sense that you cannot really rule out just like you cannot rule out the super deterministic universe, you cannot rule out a malicious being that tries to tries to make you believe that the world is not locally realistic, but in fact it's not. And this malicious being just takes the photon whenever something happens that would make you believe the world is locally realistic. So in that case, when you lose this game, right? Okay, so that's sort of this adversarial view. And it comes actually, well, this is a view that is um, maybe sometimes in physics use, but much more often when you think about cryptography, right? So when you think about cryptography, so for instance, establishing safe, secure keys between two locations, then this, this adversarial view is the right view to take as well, because you want to be sure that whatever you do, um, either you know that someone is reading your key, so you abort the protocol, or you know that that's not the case, and then you use the keys, but then you would like to be very safe that no one else could have been messing with your equipment or experiments. and So, so this view is much more common, common there than in physics, but I think here it's also at the right place. Good, so we need, to sum up, we need very high detec detection efficiencies. Good. So these are the three things that we certainly need to take care of. Once you really try to do this experiment, there is many other things, many other details that play a role. Um, I have never worked in any of these experiments, of these types of experiments, but at ETH, um, there has, uh, I think, last year, or the year before, depending on what time means, um, you actually choose, has been the first demonstration of a loophole-free Bell inequality violation using superconducting circuits, so a specific platform. And with other, with other platforms, um, this has been done earlier. Actually, the first loophole-free Bell tests have been done in 2015. So two and three together have only been simultaneously closed in 2015. So the loopholes sort of, yeah, have been closed in 2015 by teams. One was in Delft. I think one was in China, but I don't remember where exactly. And there was another one. Uh, and all of them were big collaborations uh, using different platforms. And I have actually, the, so, so the papers are linked in my, in my script. So if you want to look it up, all three publications from 2015 are, are cited in, in the script. Um, and another thing I'd like to, to say, another comment is that, so these, these were the first loophole-free Bell tests. Today, um, especially also with superconducting circuits, there is sort of an ongoing race of not just violating a Bell inequality with the highest possible confidence, but also producing Bell violations 
at very high rates, right? If you have, uh, so for instance, I think the experiment in Delft was very slow in terms of rates. So they were able to, to um, prove the Bell violation, but they had very little data because getting the data would take them months, okay? Uh, maybe weeks, but then you do it many times. So it's gonna be months. Um, and here at ETH, at, uh, in Andreas Walraff's lab, for instance, speaking of uh, superconducting circuits, what they are very good at is not just having a very high confidence in the Bell violation, but also having a very high rate. So really pushing the boundaries to producing these values faster and faster with time. Why are people racing for that? Well, because there is an, uh, an application to these Bell violations, which is the so-called um, device-independent quantum key distribution. Okay, so... So today, um, yeah, bell violations are produced, or be bell, yeah, bell violations are shown at higher rates, at actually very high rates. And that is important, for instance, for device independent key distribution. Um, what is device independent quantum key distribution? So the idea is that, so the idea of quantum key distribution, maybe without device independence, is that you use quantum systems to generate keys at two, uh, two locations far apart from each other. And the security of these keys is not based on how difficult it is to solve some specific computational problem, but it's actually based on the laws of physics. So you know that supposing that quantum theory is correct, the keys generated at these two sites are secure. So no one else could ever know it. That is quantum key distribution. But this still assumes that you know what these systems that you're having are doing. So you assume that you fully understand your, your, your device and your partner fully understands her device at their locations and the devices behave as the specification says. Now, device independent QKD is sort of the same thing, but now you no longer have to trust your device. So you can have someone else produces the device for you and you take it and you produce the keys. And even though you don't trust your device, you have means to check whether the keys that you have generated are secure or not, independent of what your device actually does. And that is even more powerful, right? Because this is the setting you would be working on after all. So you, you, no one produces his key, key device himself, right? Not, not the case today, and it will not be the case in the future. So that is um, device independent quantum key, distribu key distribution. And quantum is still relevant because what you use is quantum systems to do so, right? Classical systems would not be able to do this. And Bell violations are sort of the basis of device independent security proofs. Unfortunately, there is actually no time to go into more detail with that, but um, I think it's good to have these keywords in mind and maybe you see uh, some seminars or colloquia happening here at ETH or some, at some other locations about these topics and then hopefully we'll be able to, to connect these um, these thoughts within the next few years of your career or life. Okay. So we have 10 minutes left and I'd like to use these 10 minutes now to come back to this quantum case um, violating the CHSH inequality. As said, we will not do the calculation showing that quantum resources can violate the Bell inequality in class. This is something you're asked to do on sheet seven. And I can only encourage you to do this calculation properly because, so I, I can tell you, I have done it, I don't know, five to 10 times in my life. And I wouldn't miss any of these calculations because they remind me of what is important of the quantum violation. Why does it work? How does the measurements play together with the state and so on? What is actually going on? in terms of a block sphere picture, blah, blah, blah. There are many ways of, of calculating all of this. And I think it's really worth doing this. It, it does make a difference. Having a high level understanding of what's happening is very important. So understanding the concepts, but then doing the nitty gritty work with the calculations, you just won't get around it. This is also why I'm not 
doing it in class because even if I did, I would, I would ask you to do it again yourself. So why not just save the time and, and show you something else? Okay. So going back to the quantum strategy, what is the best possible quantum strategy? And this question is related to a comment that I've made yesterday. Remember yesterday, I think one of the last statements that I've written down was something about um, that the quantum resources with a pure two qubit state and projective measurements are able to maximally violate Bell. That's what I've said yesterday. And I didn't really say what maximally violates Bell means. Now, what it means is that essentially the best quantum strategy that you could have is achieving a winning probability of exactly the winning probability that I've written down yesterday. So this is not just an arbitrary example violating the CHS edge bound to some extent, but it is a quantum example violating the CHS edge bound to the extent that it cannot be violated further with quantum resources. And this is claim four. So in this line of claims of what is possible with what types of resources, for all quantum strategies or quantum resources. And that means, let me be precise. So that means for all Hilbert spaces, for Alice and Bob, for all possible bipartite states on these Hilbert spaces, and for all possible POVMs, Alice and Bob might aim for, so that is, these sets of operators E, X, A, and F, Y, B. It holds that the winning probability with the quantum strategy is upper bounded by this value of one half times one plus one over square root of two, which will reduce approximately 68%, right? So this means that the, the example that you will calculate explicitly on the sheet is sort of the best possible example. And it also shows that the CHS edge inequalities is indeed quite a simple inequality because you don't need to go to, to strange quantum resources, maybe unbounded dimensions of Hilbert spaces and so on to really violate this equality to the maximum. You can do it with the most simple examples that you could ever come up with. Um, there are different ways of proving this. Um, and the easiest rely on an inequality that is called Cyrilson's inequality. So um, we don't do the proof here. So you can look the, the you can look up the proof based on Cyrilson's inequality in the script. It's done explicitly. That's one way. And the reason why we don't do it, so first of all, it's in the script, but also there are other ways of proving or at least approximating this bound using so-called semi-definite programs, which is going to be a topic that we will tackle on in the next weeks. And once we have done so, you will actually prove this bound with a, a semi-definite program very nicely, which sort of connects two concepts that are seemingly different or at least not obviously connected. And so, so you will do this proof later. Or using SDPs, so semi-definite programming. And that will be done later and you will do this explicitly. Okay. Um, okay, so we have considered classical strategies, meaning strategies that can be phrased as a local hidden variable model. And we have proven that they satisfy the CHS edge bound. We have not explicitly done all calculations, but we have treated the quantum strategies and we have proved that they can violate the CHS edge bound, but themselves 
um, follow another bound, which I would call the Tyrrelson bound, because that's essentially the ingredient to the proof. Now you could ask, is it possible, or maybe not possible, but is it, is it thinkable that you could play this game and win it with probability one, 100%. And thinkable, by thinkable, I mean, well, before you knew about quantum mechanics, you wouldn't even have thought that it's possible to, to violate the CHS edge bound, most likely. Uh, and now we know how to violate this one, but we still don't know how to violate the Tyrrelson bound. So by thinkable, I mean, it's not necessarily something we need to do in practice or by an, in an experiment. I hope this is not possible because this would, if it was, quantum theory would not be correct. Um, in some cases, at least, so essentially not correct. But thinkable means, can we think of a type of correlation of a conditional probability distribution, P, A, B, given X, Y, that still respects the rules of the game, in particular the ones that I've listed, but somehow allows for a winning probability of one. So now we're sort of leaving the intuitive grounds, definitely. So if you say you have an intuition about classical physics, you have some intuition about quantum physics, all right, now we're going beyond quantum physics. Um, so let's try to tackle these questions. In terms of other strategies, not giving it a, a, a definite name to some extent. Um, so we know that with quantum resources, a winning probability of one is not possible, but is it thinkable? to have a resource or say uh, correlations to be specific. So P, A, B given X, Y leading to a winning probability of exactly one. And in particular, I mean, thinkable, thinkable. So the easy answer to this question is yes, of course you just you just define your probability distribution, P, A, B given X, Y, so that whenever X and Y are given, then A plus B is not the same as X times Y. That's the condition for, the win for winning the game, right? So thinkable, yes. But by thinkable, I mean a little bit more than that. I mean, having such a probability distribution that still respects the rules of the game. And by this, I mean, um, so it should respect um, essentially two. So let me rephrase that. So two from above, right? Um, how did I phrase that? A must not depend on Y given X and B must not depend on x given y. Okay, and now we come to your question, what does this actually mean? Now we can make it specific. And this is the last thing I'm doing today. I'm just giving you the definition and we will discuss it in detail next week. So the correlations that, that satisfy these conditions in a precise sense are called no signaling correlations. So P A B given X Y is called no signaling if the following two conditions hold. So if the probability distribution of A given X and Y both together are independent from Y. So if that's exactly the same as P of A given X not conditioning it on Y, that would be the first of these two conditions. And then likewise the same, the probability condition on Bob's outcome given X and Y is the same as the probability con uh, distribution on, of Bob's outcome only given his input. And the last comment is maybe some of you are familiar with Markov chains. So 
this is the same as saying that y x a and also x y b are Markov chains. So that's just saying statement. OK, we will inv investigate the statement in actually quite some depth next week and see how the different types of correlations, local hidden variable model, quantum, and no signaling play together against each other, how they behave, the geometry, and so on. Good. Have a nice week.